I really look forward to continue to work with him. Okay, I'll close with that, Doug, and, and thanks very much for the invite this morning. Thank you. That's fine. You could have gone on a bit longer. I think we just forgot to turn the recording on earlier. So we may not ah, okay. <laughs> Well, I just uh, you wanted a few minutes from me. I hope that's okay for you, Doug. That was very good for us. Thanks very much, Andy. It's quite quite refreshing to hear, hear that said. And it's interesting that uh, Hazards has had some a great input into that decent work and decent jobs campaign Absolutely. that the party is now, now pushing. Uh, we've got a few minutes left for some discussion and questions if anybody wants to get involved with this. Now that Andy's here, because uh, we've got till about 10.30, basically. So I see Steve's raise his hand immediately. So I'll let you get in first, Steve. Yeah, thanks for that, and thanks for that, thanks for that Andy. Um, we reported yesterday, Philip reported in yesterday, just via the chat, we didn't make a big deal of it, but um, the London Hazard Centre and the Construction Safety Campaign were involved in a, you know, with the commemoration of um, June Harvey's death um, a couple of weeks ago. We put up an EDM uh, calling for the, uh, uh, an early day motion for those, anyway, um, and, and it hardly got any signatures at all. We thought that was a blooming open goal for the likes of yourself, Andy, but it's it it, it it people I, I don't know it, it 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 it's for us outside here you you know trying to protect lives and livelihoods and we expect our MPs I know we've got the Tories have got an eighty seat majority but when something like that that gets put up we expect people to rally around and say yes we do need fr fresh regulations fresh uh, proper regulations of um uh, tower cranes. Um, so uh, just before I sign off, what have we got to do come September to make sure all the bloody Labour, sorry, all the Labour MPs um, uh, vote the right way on what they have to do to protect lives and livelihoods? They just don't seem to have a clue. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Steve. Uh, Andy, do you want to come back immediately on that one? Yeah, and then yeah. we'll yeah. well, well, thanks, thanks, Steve. Um, I I get the, 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 the power and the sentiment uh, of, of what's being said, and I wholeheartedly uh, agree with all of that. I just say with the issue of EDMs, they are just a, a, a vexed problem for, for members of parliament, and members of the, the front bench, because there, there are so uh, many EDMs come along. And the practice is uh, that we uh, backbenchers can do as they wish on those, because if we just had to have process every single EDM, would just be absolutely inundated. That's the, the harsh reality of it. It does not mean that we're not in concert with the, with the sentiment behind any particular EDM at any time. It just means the management of it, it you would be spending your time uh, dealing with that to the exclusion of all else. What I'm trying to do is to take on board the sentiments that you're expressing about better regulation and better protections in shaping policy so that it becomes meaningful. Uh, and we have that established as part of our policy going to the next election to strengthen the position now. And of course, there are endless opportunities in Parliament to raise specific issues by way of questions and other debates. And we will do that, Steve, please rest assured. Uh, but uh, uh, the issue of EDMs as the, as the expression of, uh, uh, of, of parliamentary will uh, isn't always the best way to go about things. Yeah, and also as a front bencher, you, you can't sign them anyway. So, um, right. yeah. Right. Uh, question from Sean James, which is quite an interesting one, because we had Shivana Tash speaking yesterday morning from the Wheels to UC about what's been happening with the Welsh government. And you mentioned yourself they, they've adopted a much better approach during this crisis than the Westminster government. And the question from John is how would the Labour government take on a social partnership as in Wales? So, if you want to just expand a bit on how you think that would actually work. Yeah, well, well, I actually think we can break that down regionally and, and, and do an awful lot of campaigning work. I look at my own part of the world and I see the approach adopted in Cardiff as being one, one that, that we should learn a great deal from. Um, and there is a willingness of business to engage in pay gap reporting on ethnicity and on gender. There is a real desire to do that. And it's the government that are out of step with that um, initiative. Um, so I see us as, uh, as doing this on a sort of hand, hand, hand uh, to hand combat, uh, workplace by workplace initiative and council by council. I think we can encourage that sort of working practice and work with our trade unions to get it firmly established as a better way of working. There is an appetite for this and we should roll with it. Uh, as I said in my opening comments, um, the fact that that was rejected as a National Recovery Council on a tripartite cooperative basis uh, saddens me. But the Welsh Labour government are leading the way with their initiative around social partnership 
on public procurement, uh, embedding social value into the way in which services and goods are procured. Um, so I, th I think that's the way forward, um, and it's something that I want to uh, develop on a on a, on a, a UK uh, broad basis. Yeah, and of course, the, the local government point is interesting because of the Preston model as well, isn't there? And there's the work that's being done by some of the mayors of the, of the larger Absolutely. cities, which is very interesting too. Um, a couple of others have raised hands now. Uh, can we go to James Robinson first, please? James? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, James Robinson, I'm branch secretary of Nosley Unison. So the largest section of, of our branch is Nosley Council workers. And as you're probably aware, that's a Labour-led council. You mentioned uh, quite a, a few good recommendations in terms of policy for workers, one of them being flexible work and should not be unreasonably withheld. Yet we see across the country many workers in Labour-run authorities um, have restrictive practices in place. Uh, so what do you think we could do in terms of getting la at least Labour-run councils on board with this message? If that's going to be our policy going into the next election, the least we can do is have Labour-run local authorities act into this policy prior to going into the next election. Otherwise, you're not going to get the faith of the people to go out and vote if that's what they're seeing their local council do. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, thanks, James. I mean, for, yeah, for, uh, actually, could you just take Austin as well, Andy? Thank you. Sure. Do once sure. And, yeah. Austin, do you want to come in with yours? So you're muted, Austin. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I try and go through this quickly. Um, I noticed that you talked about what Joe Biden wants to do about workers' rights, but I think uh, this is relevant to what's going on in Britain as well because. I just think we need to be, be very careful what we say. America has got, apparently, according to Leo W. Gerard, the former general secretary of the United Steelworkers Union, that is the worst union recognition laws in the world. That was his statement. The union busting is rife all over the United States. And what's important, you know, that's the law that even if we were to get rid of that law altogether in the United States, we've still got a long way to go for workers' rights. But more importantly, that the Tories have been flirting with that idea by trying to find ways of de-recognising PCS union by abolishing the uh, checkoff. That's what they tried to do. Uh, and we've had <laughs> new trade union, we had to lobby to ensure that wasn't the case for any other union. But I mean, my question is, I think we should be watching out, shouldn't we, what the Tory government's got next planned? whether they want to bring in union deal recognition laws, and that's important as far as hazards and health and safety is concerned. Very true. Do you want to deal with those two then, Andy? Yeah. Um, on James's point around Labour councils, um, I, th I think it is Im imperative that we uh, work with our colleagues in, 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 in local authorities to try to deliver on this. Uh, and these are... There are some, uh, Preston's been mentioned, and there'll be other good examples as well of people actually embracing this uh, culture. Um, I think we've got to work with them. And Nick Forbes um, actually sits as, uh, uh, in the shadow, shadow cabinet, and there's a great deal of work to be done. Uh, but I think James makes an exceptionally good point, And I just want him to be assured, as everybody else on the call, uh, to be assured that I will take that, that forward because we do want to see Labour Council has taken that opportunity to embrace better working practices and if we've got the opportunity to implement flexible working right now, um, notwithstanding the other difficulties that they face, I think that would be a step in the right direction. So please rest assured that I will take that forward and it's a, a well-made point. Austin, on the US, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not for one single second saying that all in the garden is rosy. I just see it as a major uh, gear shift in the in the US, uh, it's and it's been a welcome gear shift from what we had previously endured for four years. Uh, but if you've got a president of the United States saying that he's a union man and uh, uh, standing on a platform with businesses and unions, being asked the question, uh, "What are the unions doing here?" and says, "Well, businesses are going to have to get used to it. They're going to have to have more say. They have a low base. You're absolutely right. Their employment rights record." is pretty woeful. Uh, ours compares well by comparison. We are very, very critical of the, the poverty of the state of employment rights and protections in our country. So they do have a, a long way to make up. So I'm not for one minute deluding myself that this is um, uh, something to follow, but it's, it's a, a train of thought and a mood that we can capture. 
and there's an awful lot of people on the world stage who are saying that things have to change the exploitation of workers of long hours and low pay we cannot go on like this it's it's terribly damaging for the individual for communities but ultimately for our economy as well it makes no sense whatsoever so the mood is changing i'm trying to uh, capture that and run with it because it's to, to the advantage of the agenda that we want to pursue on the issue of uh, you mentioned pcs and the abolition of checkoff and, and the like you know, we do have that commitment and we've sustained this through 2017, 2019 and right now uh, to uh, uh, repeal the pernicious trade union legislation. There are issues around uh, thresholds, around recognition and access to the workplace. I tried my uh, uh, best from a position of opposition as Shadow Transport Secretary when looking at something like HS2, uh, that those tier one and tier two contractors should uh, open their doors to trade unions and allow them into those workplaces as of right, rather than on a wet Tuesday afternoon in a porter cabin on the extremities of the site between the hours of two and four, you know, something of this nature. That's just, that is worse than lip service. We want proper recognition and making uh, uh, union uh, access much more widely available and encouraging people at every turn to join a trade union. So there's work to be done, but that commitment to repeal the, the legislation is there, and that is my uh, focus. You're absolutely right about watching about deregulation. I alluded to that in my opening remarks around uh, the unearthing with colleagues' assistants, many of whom will be on this call, uh, about the true ambitions and plans of the business secretary. Uh, to attack um, the cap on working hours, holiday entitlement and rest breaks. We stopped that because of the embarrassment that that would, would have caused, but the intention is still there. And I strongly suspect that Ian Duncan Smith in his regulatory task force that's currently underway will be coming back to the self same things. So we will have the, uh, uh, a battle royale on our hands if that's what the truly intend and that what's what emerges but we've got to be resolute in resisting that uh, because that way uh, just lies in further exploitation further further risks being taken in the workplace and it being to the detriment of, of millions of, of working people so um, the antennae are totally and utterly raised Austin and we will be determined to resist it at every possible turn. Thanks very much for that, Andy. I've got one hand up, up which is Kat Cray, so I'll take Kat's question and then we'll, we'll call this to a close and hand over to uh, Janet to explain the workshops. Kat. Morning all. Uh, hi, Andy. I'm Kat Cray. I'm a health and safety rep on the Tube with the RNT. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, what barriers there are uh, that you think between asking for statutory sick pay for all and full sick pay for all, because as a health and safety rep, there's a, I know I've had first-hand experience of the people that I represent, uh, of there being a massive difference between the two. Uh, obviously that's come under the microscope uh, with COVID, but um, yeah, I, I'd like to know why the, why good, good. the party didn't go a little further good, good um, in, yeah. in asking for that, as politely as possible. Okay, um, well on SSP, uh, in it, well, the initial, observation is that just the number of people are excluded from it. Um, you, you have people below the uh, minimum earnings, uh, lower earnings level. Uh, and it is just a bizarre concept that because you earn uh, a, a very low level of pay, that excludes you from sick pay in circumstances when you need that support. Uh, and that's against the backdrop of uh, open admissions from government ministers that they could not possibly survive on SSP if indeed they were entitled to it. So you have that in the first instance. You've also got millions of self-employed people, uh, people in either genuine self-employment, which of course we, we want to maintain people in genuine self-employment, but those in bogus self-employment have no access to it whatsoever. And in this COVID crisis, that just, just absolutely exposes uh, uh, the, 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 the fallacy and stupidity of having a system that would actually force somebody to take a risk and go to work because they cannot sustain themselves. They have no income whatsoever. Um, so that is a, 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 a staggering indictment of our current social security arrangements. But importantly, you, you, you raised raise the, the, the critical point of the, the amount. Um, uh, now, I'm, I'm not here to set out 
policy in detail right now ahead of a of an election but surely to goodness it's got to be at a level that people can survive on and at 95 96 pounds a week that is not doable so we've got to reflect on that there's been talk of it being uh, linked to the the real living wage i think that's an that's an interesting and important discussion to have uh, and we've got to we've got to resolve that uh, but if we can get enough consensus around this it takes the the sting out here if, if people will simply accept that when people are certified as being poorly and unable to continue to work that they will have access to at least a decent statutory system of support uh, of course if people are able to bargain in their place of work for a, a better level of uh, of sick pay that is all to the good but we've got to change the the debate in the first instance that somehow people are just wanting to swing the lead and just take advantage what well, couldn't be further from the truth um but that's the tone of the the, the current discussion so the points of eligibility in the first instance that has got to be resolved and then the level of ssp has to be resolved and it, it simply has got to be a livable uh, amount of money whilst you're having that period of sickness thanks andy Thanks very much, Andy. That's a very comprehensive answer for that one as well. And thanks very much for your time this morning, Andy. That's been a very good session for us. Yeah. Uh, Enjoyed that and have a great day.